Thanks. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kip, and thank you for accommodating a later time slot. I had planned to fly in this morning because I am raising a nine-year-old baseball fanatic who was um, desperate to see the Nats play in the um, NLCS last night and win. So, um, Anyway, I'm just thrilled to be here. I really wanted to be at this event um, in part to talk to you about the Business Roundtable statement that Kip just mentioned, um, and also to congratulate you because so many of the people in this room really have been at the forefront of the movement that led to that statement. Um, and also to, to get your insights. The statement is a really important first step, but we're struggling and grappling with a lot of the implications of it. And so if it's okay, I'll talk for a minute about what we think the statement means, and then I would love to open it up and hear thoughts or comments from any of you. So as Kip was mentioning, Business Roundtable is an association of CEOs, uh, about 200 CEOs of some of the country's largest companies. Um, so our members include household names like Jamie Dimon, Jeff Bezos, Jenny Rometty, and many others. We include CEOs from every sector of the economy, from energy, finance, retail, manufacturing, and so on. Since the 1970s, Business Roundtable has put out principles of corporate governance, which address things like duties of uh, management and boards, and so on. And in every edition, Business Roundtable has included language on the purpose and responsibilities of corporations. What role do corporations play in society? In the very early days, that language talked about the need to invest in all of your stakeholders, to build a company that really depended on the contributions um, and investments of many stakeholders, and to build something that would be sustainable for the long term. In 1997, though, Business Roundtable adopted new language, um, which said something to the effect of, we wish to emphasize that the primary duty of a corporation is, is to its shareholders. Now, we've done a lot of historical research about why BRT adopted this language, um, what the so-called shareholder primacy language, and there are lots of different theories. Some people say that it was sort of hangover from the decades of corporate raiders, that CEOs were really anxious to show their other shareholders that they had a commitment to them. Um, some people have said that it was a different time in capitalism. They were more capital-intensive industries, and to be a successful company, you had to look like you were a really good investment. And my own view is really, you know, this was um, sometime after kind of Milton Friedman's um, original piece on this and that it had somehow become kind of part of conventional wisdom, part of the water in business schools and law schools that well-run companies focused exclusively on their shareholders. That sure, you might invest in your workers, you might invest in your suppliers, but you really only did that if you thought that you could see some some immediate tangible result for your shareholders. For whatever reason, that language was reiterated multiple times, um, including as recently as 2016. This came to the attention, it really, um, really didn't get a lot of attention at all at BRT, um, until 2018 when our new CEO, Josh Bolton, um, and our new chairman, Jamie Dimon, um, began reading some criticisms of the statement from some uh, well-known corporate critics like Stephen Perlstein, Rick Wurtzman, and others. And some of the language was that this BRT statement, this change of position, was really the beginning of the end for capitalism. Um, we thought that was a gross overstatement. You know, it's just uh, words on a piece of paper. But in listening to them, we started to think, hey, they may have a point. Actually, words do matter. Um, and they particularly matter when they're words that represent the views of people who occupy such an important position in our country's economy, that this was setting a standard not just for the companies who were part of BRT, but for other companies. And so we started doing a lot of research. We started talking to corporate governance experts. We started talking to lawyers. Um, we did a lot of reading, including reading of um, some of the authors in this room, and started to dig in. And most importantly, we started interviewing our CEOs, um, who said to a person, that's not the way that I try to run my company. Of course, I want to be a good investment for my shareholders, but I also want to be a good employer. I want to be a good member of my community. I want to be a good partner to my suppliers. And so we realized that we had been defending, spending time defending language that didn't actually represent what our companies were, were trying to do. We also made um, one other observation, which was that a lot of the debate over this was resting on a misimpression of 
corporate law, corporate fiduciary duty law. Um, I went to law school here at the University of Texas, um, and I had this, in the back of my head, had this idea that Delaware fiduciary duty law meant that you had to focus on your, exclusively on your shareholders. And of course, you all know that that's not right, that there's plenty of room. Delaware law says that you have to make decisions that are in the long-term interests of your shareholders, but there's nothing in Delaware law that says you can't try to also do lots of other things. And it's just common sense that in 2019, to run a successful company, you have to be able to do more than one thing. In any event, we ran a process um, through the BRT uh, CEOs. The CEOs dug in. They redrafted a lot of the language. They took things out. They put things in. Um, and in the end, came up uh, with a kind of discussion of the full membership, came up with a decision to change the statement. In the end, 183 of our CEOs um, signed the statement. Um, and the reaction really um, completely shocked us. You know, we knew that this would be news. But when we put it out, um, to date, we've had about 29,000 media mentions, um, most but not all of which are positive. And I want to talk to you about some of the criticisms. Um, it was clear to us that this new statement hit a nerve. Um, you know, as leaders of this movement, I think you all know, know what uh, we're up against, but I think it tapped into the sense of many Americans that the system has been rigged, um, that it's benefiting the people who are already on top. Um, many Americans, I think, uh, are feeling this relationship with risk, that a single healthcare event, um, the threats of automation and other things are meaning that they're, they don't enjoy economic security, um, and of course, lack of economic mobility, the sense that hard work isn't rewarded. And so I think we put this statement out in this context, um, and the, you know, the reaction was really overwhelming. We've heard criticisms both from the right, um, from the Wall Street Journal, that we've abandoned capitalism, that we're trying to placate socialists, um, which of course isn't true. Uh, our members to a person believe that capitalism is um, a force for good, um, a force for innovation and competition, that it's also the most moral rent way to run an economy because it depends on individual choice and decision. Um, and then from the left, we've heard a different set of criticisms. Uh, so for example, Elizabeth Warren sent a letter to uh, many of our members last week saying, okay, that's all well and good, but if you agree to it, you'll accept my Accountable Capitalism Act, which uh, basically requires every company to receive a federal charter, which requires them to act for the general public good um, and creates a new office at the Department of Commerce to enforce that. And our reaction to that is that what we're trying to build is the kind of conscious capitalist com companies that you all know, one where it's collaborative and creative, where you build a win-win model around stakeholders, and we want to build that authentically because it's the best way to run a business, not because someone at the Department of Commerce told you that that's what you're supposed to do. In any event, um, we're, we're facing sort of one of, you know, just spending a lot of time thinking about some of the big challenges that came out of this statement, and I'll just put three to you, and then I hope to have time, a couple minutes to open it up for comments. Um, one big challenge is that all of our members are giant publicly traded companies. And so what do you do to make sure that the big investors are part of the discussion? Two major institutional investors, BlackRock and Vanguard, sign the statement and are fully on board. But of course, for some investors, this discussion about building a multi-stakeholder model is lip service. Um, and for some investors, it's not even that. Um, and so how do you, what do you do, even for investors who have a long-term view, sometimes will give their money to be managed by um, asset managers with very short-term views. So what do you do to get shareholders to the table? Uh, one is this question that the Elizabeth Warren letter raises, which is what's the role of government? Ironically, one of the things that the letter has drawn out is that some groups who normally are supportive of a large role of government actually want to see a much bigger role for the, public, for the private sector in solving some of the societal challenges I talked about. And ironically, some groups on the right who normally support private sector leadership are saying that's not up to companies, that's the job of government. Anyway, what is the role of companies in solving some of these, these bigger challenges and what's the role of, uh, of the private sector? And then finally, how do we know if we're succeeding? So one of the frequent requests we make is, how are you going to measure success? And of course, the, move, the um, ideals that we're talking about are complicated. They don't lend themselves to one-size-fits-all solutions. 
the company that's really um, designed around these principles in the retail sector may look completely different than the company that's designed around them in the finance sector. And so one of the things we're working on with Just Capital um, and others is to think about this long-term challenge of measurement. Okay, I think I have five minutes left. So anyway, I would love to, I would love to hear any comments or questions um, from any of you. Please, yes, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, thank you. I was very excited to see the statement come out. I thought that was a watershed moment, and I applaud you for it. There was another statement that came out in a full-page ad in the New York Times uh, that, actu that immediately followed it that brought me to tears of pride, and that was my fellow B Corporation CEOs mm -hmm. who said, you know, we've been doing a stakeholder model for a mm -hmm. long time. We're glad to have you join us. We're, ha we're, we're happy to help you learn. Have you begun to engage with B-Lab and other B-Corporation CEOs? We have um, in two ways. So um, Leo Strine, as you know, the Chief Justice of the Delaware Supreme Court, had a big event that include, included a lot of the B-Lab folks. Um, and so we talked to them there. Um, and we're thinking there are sort of two different, I guess, avenues for us. Um, one is that B-Lab would like to see more companies of our members submit themselves to B-Lab certification, um, and I think that's possible. The other question is the state benefit corporation model, and some people like Justice Strine would like to see BRT support lowering the threshold for companies to reincorporate as benefit corporations, and that's something we've, we've just started looking at but don't have a decision yet. But for lots of companies, I think, I think either of those would be, a, would be a very good model. Yes, in the back. Is there a way for us as conscious capitalists to work with you and your organization? And how do we work collectively to make this something that starts as an idea and becomes a reality? We would love it. I mean, we would love any ideas about that. One of the things that I think has, has struck me, this wasn't the world that I occupied before I took the business roundtable job. And one thing I've realized is um, how many kind of different interesting um, movements there are occupying kind of overlapping space, and so one thing we've been trying to think about is how to bring some energy behind the whole movement, but we would love it. We would love to um, have the insights of people who've kind of been in the fight for a long time. So I, anyway, I hope you'll share ideas about that. My email, um, if anybody wants to submit them, is uh, ksilverberg at brt.org, and of course the, um, the organizers here can connect me with anyone. Yes. I guess I speak into this. Is that how it works? Okay. Um, so this is this is new to me. I I, um, I attended the NACD conference in Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. and the statement on the purpose of the corporation kind of hijacked <laughs> that organization's oh. theme. It was actually very good. Oh. Um, there was a lot of conversation about it. And my question is: one of the things that I think needs to be done is to educate the board members of corporate mm -hmm. America. They are not on board yet and what can we collectively do to get them to understand that this is the right way to to do business and and and, and to he create healing organizations because i think they are the decision makers and that's where we also need to focus some effort because they're not on board yet i think that's a really smart insight um and when i'm speaking at some kind of groups that sponsor board members. Um, but I do think we need a more concerted effort on that. In our dream world, we would have a bunch of corporate boards who would kind of adopt the statement as their own, who would say, um, here as Company X, here's our purpose, kind of the reason that we exist. Here's our mission, um, the way I'm borrowing from Raj's formulation, but here's our mission, here's how we want to do that, and here's how we're going to, here's our kind of stakeholder investment model. So here's all the things we're doing to make that work for our company. Because as I say, it's not a one size fits all. It's going to take a lot of work from corporate boards to figure out how to put it into practice. So I think Are that's a very smart idea. tomorrow or when do you leave? Um, actually, I leave shortly after the, <laughs> these remarks okay. to head off to Atlanta for another set of Then we need to communicate by email. Yes, please okay. do. Thanks. Thank you. One more. Yeah. I was at a conference that had a box and you had to throw it um, and, uh, yeah, I found it. It was a deterrent to speaking. I found it really intimidating. 
us. All right, thank you, Kristen. Um, glad to ask the last question here. Curious, you as a as a as a policy expert, um, you talk about the sort of uh, unilateral nature of the Warren proposal, and you talk about the need for collaboration. Um, how do you think about personally? How do you think about guiding these CEOs and the organization uh, to navigate the inherent uh, conflicts of interest mm -hmm. with the CEOs and corporations suggesting policy when in Europe or in other jurisdictions where the government does have um, a stronger hand, mm -hmm. these stakeholders are supported in a way that they haven't been in America? I guess I don't, I don't see a conflict between CEOs advocating for what they think, think are sound economic policies and these things. I think you can do both. And one of the things that I thought that was really important to get across from our statement is all of our CEOs still support economic growth. You know, that's a prerequisite to broader economic opportunity. They still support innovation, um, which is key to building economic growth over the long term. What they've said is you've got to do more, that kind of broad economic growth isn't enough, that you actually need an economic growth in which every American feels like they've got a stake in it. And part of that is, I think, companies running in the ways that we've talked about Part of it is the government has to do a lot of things that it's not doing. You know, we've called, for example, for an increase in the minimum wage, um, which seems like a good starting point. We've called for lots of investments in worker training. Um, right now, you know, we have, a, um, in federal policy, we have a massive amount of federal resources going out to support a single career path, which is a four-year degree, even though lots of Americans, there's a great career path that doesn't involve that or any of the student debt that comes with it. So anyway, we do think there's a role for government in doing those things too. So in my ideal world, we have CEOs who are great advocates for sound economic policies and who are also running their companies in these ways that, that we think are gonna build stronger long-term um, value. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks so much, Christian. Thanks a lot.